Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Time being 9 a.m., uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, start our Judicial and Public Safety Committee meeting for Thursday, July 15th. Uh, my name is Myrna Molina and I'll be chairing today's meeting. Um, may I please have roll call? Brown? Here. Gums? Gums here. Leonard? Leonard here. Sanchez? Sanchez here. Chepro? Davis? Molina. Molina present. Okay, uh, next item on our, on our agenda is approval of minutes. We'll um, I have a motion to move. Leonard seconds. And a second, uh, Mr. Brown moves and Mr. Leonard seconds. Um, any questions or comments regarding the minutes that we were received? Okay, here and seeing none, may I please have a call. Brown? Yes. Gums? Yes. Leonard? Leonard, yes. Sanchez? Sanchez, yes. Davis? Shepro? Okay, and the minutes are approved. Um, do we have any uh, public comment in the audience or anyone that signed up for public comment? No, okay, so we'll go ahead and move on on our agenda. Um, we have our judiciary financial reports on file. Um, next item on our agenda is our KingCom. Uh, good morning, Ms. Gunthry. Good morning. Lots of great news to share from um, last month in June. Um, our telecommunicator that was in training, Emily Perez, she has graduated from the training program and she is assigned to day shift. We continue the hiring process. We've got a couple telecommunicator vacancies as well as a couple supervisor vacancies. So big thank you to the Diagnostic Center who continues to provide us support as we get through the psychological testing. Um, but that is an ongoing process for us. We're all just doing a lot more with, um, with a little less resources. Um, we did have a lot of recognition, you know, it, it's been a really challenging year and um, I am pleased to report that I think I've written six good job letters in the past two months. Uh, three of those were for telecommunicators, um, Becca Shope, Mary Keating and Kezia Moore. They were recognized by the Pingree Grove Police Department for great work that they did on a domestic case. The offender had provided a false name and using the tools that we use in dispatch, they were actually able to locate the real offender's name and officers were quickly sent to the residence um, and it became a safe situation that was a very unsafe situation. At the end of the month, telecommunicator Jim Holden, um, I'm sure you recognize that name. He's been recognized by the county board before. He was recognized by Hampshire Fire Department for his exceptional work on a CPR call. It was 8.30 a.m. Um, the, the manager of this business called, said that one of his employees had collapsed and Jim quickly provided CPR. And I mean, he saved the guy's life. So um, had not for those quick efforts and, and just the great call taking that he does, the outcome could have been very different. Um, last month, we did recognize um, Shelly Lemons in, in two different, she's our, our afternoon shift supervisor, um, been with KingCom almost 30 years, and, you know, she had a number of actually very, very difficult calls, um, so we recognized her for the incredibly hard work that she did on those two very difficult calls. Other than that, our volume of activity continues to increase. We show an increase over last year. Um, this was about the time last year that after COVID, it started to pick up again, but we are still trending on the incline. So that is all I have for this month, if anybody has any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Guthrie? Okay, thank you so much for your report. Thank you. Okay, uh, next item on our agenda is our sheriff. Um, sheriff Hayne, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, all my reports are on file. I'm going to be part of a larger presentation under the uh, chief judge time frame, so I'm going to save any uh, further discussion for that point, and uh, we can move right to the resolutions if you'd like. Okay. Um, so the, the first resolution is um, Groundhog Day. It's on our agenda the last three months, so um, <laughs> I, we talked a little bit about it. Um, finance requested that um, our committee take on the public safety plan for the Judicial Center. Um, so. I see their intent on what they want us to do. I don't think it's, um, I think it's kind of parallel to this resolution because this resolution is asking for somebody to pay for the person we have downstairs now. So um, I guess I will, before I ask for a motion and second to move this back to finance, I'd like um, our members on the finance committee to kind of take that back to the committee. I don't know if you have any, um, anything you want to add to that right now, but um, my idea would be to kind of come up with a plan under, you know, your, your guidance. Um, if you want a direction from the county board, I think um, it would be maybe a good idea maybe form a subcommittee if that's what you wanted to form this plan. Um, but I kind of think there are two parallel things at this point. So um, 
Yeah, I agree that they're they're parallel. If I may, I also think they're completely apart in that one is just a mechanism to make sure that we stay under budget and have this person paid for by that request and then making sure that larger project is moving along and i know chris allen's doing a, a fine job of getting that planning in place here so i'm just concerned about making sure that we do that budget allocation where the where the finances are available okay i agree so um should i make i'll make a motion and second to discuss this again okay uh leonard moose Leonard moves and Brown seconds. And then Mr. Leonard, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I just wanted to mention I had an opportunity to speak with the Sheriff about this. Um, the people on the Finance Council were concerned with whether or not there was a less expensive way to handle this. And uh, I was assured, and I agree totally with the Sheriff, that there at this point there is not. And so I will uh, be recommending to the Finance Committee, once this moves forward, that we pass that along to, to the County Board for approval. I see no reason to delay this any longer. It's, it's a needed thing and it's, we're doing it the most economical way we can. Okay, thank you, Mr. Leonard. Any further questions or discussion regarding this resolution? Madam Chair. Mr. Brown? Just to bring up the question, because I would suspect that it will get brought up again at the finance. I'm not sure, Bill, but it was discussed a little bit about the possibility of bringing on an additional employee so we don't have to pay the overtime for this employee that sits there. Um, can you talk about that? Mr. Leonard? Uh, yes. Um, you know, in speaking with Sheriff Payne, he said there is a possibility that he may have someone in-house who might be near the end of their career that would wanna do this. And then he could hire someone else uh, as a new deputy at a lower rate too. So I think the sheriff's got that all figured out. We just have to have uh, the understanding that he will handle it the most economical way, which he does on everything. I did submit that re request with our FY22 budget for that extra person. So if the, uh, the board so chooses, then we'll go that route. Thank you. Okay, so I guess, um... We're, we're on track, we have a plan. Um, we, we trust Sheriff Payne to provide us with the most economical way of, of making sure that this building is safe for now. And um, we look forward to seeing what your ideas are next month. Question, um, Madam Chair, Shepro. Yes, Mr. Shepro. Uh, I just, so uh, for the Sheriff and Mr. Leonard, uh, does this resolution in your view then give uh, you use sufficient flexibility that you can go either way. You can use an existing person or, or uh, would we still have to wait for the, a, a budget for next year for the possibly potential retiree uh, replacement? So does this cover both Mr. Brown's point and the original idea? Yeah, so this would take us through the end of FY21, and then we'd be in a position at the beginning of FY22 with that additional funding for that position where we could either maintain for a short time while we get somebody trained up and in place, or uh, you know we just hire a person flat out for that job. So essentially the answer is this is the last time if that FY22 right. uh, position is approved that you'll see this. I just uh, joined Mr. Leonard's comment. I think... Uh, you know, at some point we've talked this to death and I think we've everybody agrees we need this person. So uh, I also will support it and thank the sheriff for his uh, you know, continued efforts to uh, provide us with security. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, no further comments or questions. Um, may I please have roll call to move this resolution back to finance. Mr. Brown. Brown? Yes. Gums? Gums, yes. Leonard? Leonard, yes. Sanchez? Sanchez, yes. Shepro? Shepro, yes. Davis? Yes. Okay, thank you. This resolution passes to finance. Okay, um, would you like to discuss your second resolution? Yeah, so the fresh news is on this. Obviously, we've been talking about the addiction treatment center concept for the better part of two and a half years over at the sheriff's office. Took a lot of uh, legislation to get this lined up and in place. And the state's attorney's office was reviewing this resolution here that was to go to admin yesterday. And at the last minute, we all decided that the best thing to do would be to pull this off. So I apologize that it made it on this agenda, but we, uh, we pulled it off the agenda yesterday. 
and the state's attorney's office has directed us to go straight to RFP for that third party leasing provider and then come back once we have that person picked and okay. do the full resolution so we don't have to do Groundhog's Day again. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, and then the uh, resolution D was um, added an error. We, we passed this last month. So this will move on to our um, executive committee meeting in August. So, okay. Thank you, Sheriff Hain. Thank you. Okay, um, so next item on our agenda is our state's attorney. Good morning, Ms. Mosser. Good morning. Uh, our full report is on file as well, and because I will be joining the chief judge's presentation as well, we are going to go ahead and discuss everything then. If there's any questions about uh, how the state's attorney's office is operating, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Okay, thank you. I think we'll defer all questions to during the presentation. Um, public defender. Good morning. Um, our full report is on file as well. Just have a couple of things and then I'll be joining the presentation as well. Uh, we are happy to announce that we will be full staff. We have just hired two new attorneys. Um, one of those is based upon the graciousness of the board and giving us the abuse and neglect attorney. So our one attorney that is doing abuse and neglect is so thrilled to now be getting uh, that help. So that is starting this month. I also am working on um, and almost there in getting help for our post-conviction petitions. A, um, I know that I spoke to the board about this in March. That is another area of our office that is sort of skyrocketing. Um, and I'm working on getting help for him as well. Uh, so he is very um, happy to hear that. Um, and also one of the goals when I started this job was to open our juvenile courtroom to rotate to a rotation for our misdemeanor attorneys, because I think that that is a great training ground for them. And I'm happy to announce that I starting this month, we are also opening uh, juvenile delinquency to the misdemeanor attorneys for rotation. So I'm really excited about that, as are the, the attorneys who are going in there. And I think that that will help when we open the new courtroom there, because our office will have four attorneys then over in, um, juvenile, in the juvenile courthouse. And that's all I have other than the presentation. Okay, great, thank you so much. Okay, um, so we'll move on to our judiciary and courts. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. A couple of things in my monthly report uh, before we begin our presentation, I just wanna let the county board know that uh, the Supreme Court did enter an order um, indicating that we no longer had to abide by their social distancing guidelines and that the speedy trial provision that had been suspended for almost uh, 15 months is gonna be uh, back in play on October 1st. So the reason that those two orders are so important is because uh, we are now going back to having court in our individual courtrooms, uh, more in person than remote. And also uh, we restarted jury trials in individual courtrooms. So we had three jury trials that went this Monday. Um, in the past under COVID, we could only have one go on Monday and Wednesday. Uh, one case is a murder trial, uh, the murder that allegedly took place in 2004. The case has been pending, not since 2004, um, but we're back on track. And so I wanna just let the county board know that we feel like with everything that we've done, um, not that COVID's over, we understand that it's not over, um, but we are getting back to almost business as usual and the jury trials will continue uh, each Monday uh, from this point forward. So if I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has about that before we go to our presentation. Any questions for Chief Judge Hall? Okay. Yes, okay. Uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Shepro, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Judge, I had a, a constituent ask me yesterday, he had received a jury summons some weeks ago, and it said that he would have to have a mask uh, to enter the courthouse. And I wondered if that was still true in light of further orders that have come out uh, more recently. Yeah. No, uh, so, so great question. Uh, we have to call jurors in six to eight weeks in advance. And so what we were doing to inform the jurors as they came in the building was that they were gonna have to be masked. And at that time, that was the protocol and procedure. Um, now uh, that protocol is no longer in place. And then uh, those inserts that went into our juror summons are no longer there. Um, so that was just a matter of timing and not being able to identify and get out that information to the people that received that. So uh, what, we, what we have our policy in the courthouse is that if you are vaccinated, uh, you do not have to wear a mask. If you're unvaccinated, you do. And that's a, you know, an honor system 
Correct. We we consulted with our health department and like others, uh, didn't feel like based upon the volume of coming through that we would ask people at the door to show proof of vaccination. So it is on the honor system. Uh, what we have found, though, and even with the jurors coming in, is that we do have a number of individuals that are on their own wearing masks. So that's been a very positive. Uh, you know, people are, are taking responsibility, individual responsibility and wearing those masks when they come in. Thank you. I, I told them to bring one just in case. Yeah, no, I, it, we're going to have a lapse there for a little while. We've also posted that information on our Facebook page on the self-help law library page. And we've tried to push that out, but uh, like anything we are, you know, there are some people that miss that information. Thank you. Great, thank you. So, so then at this point, uh, Chairman, on the, last, uh, on the last court date, or the last court date, the last date that I was in front of you, um, the Judicial and Public Safety and yourself had indicated that you thought that it would be a good idea if we could collectively come in to talk to you about the new Safety Act and the implications it might have on uh, our court system and financially on the county board. So since that time over the last month, we've worked together collectively to put together a presentation for you. And with your permission, I'd like to ask that the PowerPoint be put up and we could go ahead and do that at this time. Great, thank you. And then for the rest of the group, I'm not sure if I have the clicker. And so what we can do is if, if you're okay, we can either present at the podium or if you'd like, we can stay where we're at and then I'll just pass the clicker around, whatever you're. Whatever everybody's comfortable with. Yeah. Okay. Pass it around. Just pass it around. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we'll go ahead and, and Blair, where the man behind the, where am I pointing to move the slides? Um, should... Just anywhere. Just... All right. So, so the presentation is uh, that we want to go through and that we put together for you it talks about the safety act and the Safety Act refers to the safety, accountability, fairness, and equity today. That's how the legislature put it together. Um, as we go through this, you're gonna hear a presentation from all the judicial partners that are here. What we do wanna let you know, and as we've set up there, is that when we talk about the costs that we anticipate, those are estimates at this time. Um, we did our best to look through based upon what the legislation looks like today. Um, but the legislature has continued to and will continue to do consider trailer bills that might impact the overall costs. T to give you a background of the Safety Act, uh, the sponsors uh, are listed, um, but there were four pillars of that Safety Act. The one that we're talking about today is the criminal justice reform, but it also hit up on education and workforce development, economic access, equity and opportunity and then the healthcare and human services portion. But again, for the purposes of this committee, we're gonna focus on the criminal justice reform. For the purposes, when we go through, and I'm just gonna, the next four or five slides are just gonna hit the, the high points of the Safety Act. Um, when it relates to custody and sentencing reform, uh, the biggest thing that you've heard about is the fact that uh, starting January 1st of 2023, uh, the state of Illinois is eliminating the cash bail system that's been in place for decades. So what that means is that instead of having a defendant who's arrested be required to post a cash bail to be released, the judiciary will be asked to make a decision at a pretrial detention hearing whether the person should be detained based upon certain standards. And if the person meets that standards after a hearing, they will be detained and will not be able to be released with, with posting any money. Um, but there is a favor towards releasing most people on their own recognizance with certain conditions imposed. Um, I'm just going to run through this real quick. When you talk about, again, the other highlights, uh, it highlights, the bill highlights uh, violence reduction and victim services, talks about police accountability, which the sheriff will talk about and has been on top of even before the Safety Act. Uh, community relations, certification review, and the powers and duties as it relates to different uh, proposals that, again, I'll let the sheriff discuss. And the way that we're going to do this today is uh, I'm going to talk first about how this will impact the judiciary, and then we'll go through probation, sheriff, state's attorney, public defender, and the clerk of the circuit court. And so I, I think that the best way to go about it would be to have us all present, and if there's questions at the end, to, to have all the questions at the end. On the judicial side, uh, it's gonna be very, 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 very brief presentation because what we're really talking about and the impact on the judiciary will be the pretrial detention hearing. Right now, 
We have what's called the bond call system. We run that bond call system seven days a week. Uh, at that bond call is the circuit clerk, state's attorney, public defender, sheriff, and uh, everybody that's been arrested within the last 24 to 48 hours comes before a judge on, on a felony and has a bond call where uh, evidence is heard and bail is set. Now, based upon the new legislation, what's going to happen is that there's going to be what they call a net of offenses for which somebody could be detained. If you're not within that net of offenses, then the judge either release or the officers either release you on your signature at the scene, or if you do come in front of a judge, a judge will set pretrial conditions, but you won't be detained. Um, the, the impact on the court system and the impact uh, on the Kane County as it relates to the judicial side was that these pretrial detention hearings, a typical bond call hearing might last between five to 10 minutes. Um, based upon where we're going to go with these pretrial detention hearings, it's a full-blown hearing with evidentiary requirements, discovery obligations, reviews and pretrials that have to be done. And so this courtroom that we have right now where we do bond call, in the morning we do bond call, but in late morning, early afternoon, we use that courtroom for orders of protection and other uh, hearings. What we're going to have to do is dedicate uh, that courtroom full-time for pretrial detention hearings, which will the end result is we're going to have to find another courtroom in another location for those plenary orders of protection and also have to accommodate the additional staff that we're going to need for those pretrial detention hearings. With that, I'm going to pass the clicker down and I'm going to give it uh, to Latanya for court services and probation. Good morning. Um, board, I was here back in May and gave you guys some information about our pretrial department and how we um, prepare and provide information to um, the judicial partners for our bond hearings. Um, this presentation, my presentation will be brief, but I will have the opportunity to reiterate that our expansion of our pretrial department back in 2016 pretty much um, placed us in a pretty good situation with this Safety Act. Much of what is in included in the Safety Act as it relates to pretrial departments across the state, we were aware of in some ways except expecting it due to the Supreme Court Commission report on pretrial practices and the recommendations in that report that was issued back in May of 2020. Um, one of the big pieces of the Safety Act is that there will be a pretrial practices data oversight board that is in the process of being formed that board is going to meet on a quarterly basis. It's what those that board will recommend and require pretrial departments to submit is going to be the biggest change or the most difficult hurdle, I would say, for our department. One, um, we do not have the data set as it stands right now. However, with what um, requirements are already in the statute, we know that we will have to collaborate with all the ju justice partners that's here today. So we've got to figure out what the data points are going to be, how we have to submit that to AOIC and what format they want it. And, and certain data points will only be able to come from the state's attorney's office. Some is only gonna come from the sheriff or the clerk. So we've already started having some discussions with IT as to what that looks like. With as, within our department internally, we're not sure if that means we're gonna to have to expand our current case management system. Does that mean that um, we will have to go into a different case management system? If, is IT gonna to have to build something for us? Those are some of the discussions that we're having and that's what we're we really can't give you a monetary value at this time because one, we have to wait to get those data sets from AOIC and see what that looks like. Um, it will also play a part in how the state decides to do pretrial um, and we're still waiting on some decisions with that as to how it will affect us directly within court services. So another piece of the legislation talks about the, validate, the use of a validated risk assessment. Because of us being selected as a pilot site back in 2016, we are already using a validated risk assessment, which is the public safety assessment. Um, our officers complete that every morning, is submitted every morning for bond call. Um, and it's the way the recommendations are written from that Supreme Court report is stating that until the state of Illinois issues or implements a statewide risk assessment, you are ultimately allowed to use any of three risk assessments that have been identified to be a validated tool, which we're already doing. 
So in other words, we're really well situated for that portion of the statute. Um, what we've decided to do is just give you a, a quick view into June of 2021 so that you can see on average how many um, people that appear in bond call are released. So that first bar is showing you um, how many are released the same day of bond call. And as you can see, um, as those days increase, after a week, we're pretty much 85% of those that appear in bond call are released back into the community. For the last five years or so, we've already averaged providing supervision for 85 to 90% of those people released anyway. So based upon our current staffing, we feel that we will be able to supervise those that are released in the community because ultimately we've been doing that thus far. And depending on how um, the statute is interpreted and how those might be detained, those numbers may actually decrease a little bit for us. Sure. So much like court services at the sheriff's office, we predicted and knew that there had to be some serious updates and changes to the way we did business. Uh, I've had the luxury of being in office for two and a half years and the team in place for that amount of time. So we've, we feel like we've gotten a lot done in that regard to be ahead of the justice reform. But, you know, I do have to point to the fact that this could have several more trailer bills that adjust several more things down the road. So we don't know the ultimate outcome. I do have to give a huge shout out to state's attorney Mosser who received statewide recognition for her work in getting mostly the law enforcement related issues straightened away with the uh, sponsors of the bill that were not even feasible at the onset and uh, sheriffs across the state lauded her for her work. So thank you for that. Um, so. Over the last two and a half years, we implemented what's called a tactical training unit. Their entire job has been to formalize training on a monthly basis at the sheriff's office and make sure our deputies are going through stress-induced and de-escalation techniques on a monthly basis. Um, so this group is already in place, it's already funded, and it's already doing the job, we're proud to say, of, of the mandates of the bill. Uh, we will be seeking additional funds for EMT training. That's something that we asked for uh, through the American Rescue Plan funds in, uh, in one of our Many asked, sorry, Jarrett. Uh, mental health screenings. So we just did an average here, realizing that the Diagnostic Center here in Kane is doing a heck of a lot of work already. It's not feasible to put 115 deputies on their shoulders uh, for all of that work. So if we send it out for, um, for support, that'd be 23,000. <laughs> Uh, annually, but we currently do offer many different rungs of support. We just need a little more definition of what they're expecting of us when it comes to a mental health screening. As we know, we implemented our body camera program funded from within our existing budget last year, and we've budgeted out for the next few years. Uh, you know, I'm proud to say that counties like DuPage did a similar presentation, and the sheriff's office alone was expecting a $15 million impact. A big portion of that was body cameras. and Again, we're already there. One expense will be uh, duty to render aid under that portion of the statute. I will be looking to add another 68 AEDs and additional training for first responder and first aid care. Um, that's something that's essential. And this would place an AED in every single police vehicle that the sheriff's office has. We currently have 22 out there in the field right now. Uh, our mental health incidents and any use of force reports, we are expecting uh, there to be an electronic portal. Uh, I know the Illinois State Police is leading the charge on that, on uh, their public integrity platform. Uh, we did create a new clerical position at the Sheriff's Office. Uh, it's an assistant supervisor to help oversee uh, all the records and operations of this. And then we had to hire a uh, $55,000, I'm sorry, that new position that was created was already an in-place uh, union position um, and then we added the uh, the additional clerical person and they're going to be supporting all the body cam activity and the civilian side of electronic monitoring which is always a lot of work now here's the good news so covid kind of gave us a sample of what reduced jail populations will save the county so we're estimating a 25 percent reduction in the current jail population under the existing budget okay that's a model that we're using when fy23 kicks in so we're looking at saving you see the the huge savings in medical and food costs there will be that slight decrease in revenue from uh, phone calls and, and make commissary but looking into fy23 
three, as we asked for in FY22, two additional deputies that we would assign to our electronic monitoring team, because it takes about a year to get a deputy all the way up to speed and active uh, in patrol and out on their own. So if we can add two more people to our electronic monitoring team, which I think the judiciary partners all agree is gonna be at least tripling, if not quadrupling in activity, um, that would be the one expense that we look at right away in FY22, but by FY23, we anticipate, again, with that 25% reduction in jail population, the reduction of potentially up to five corrections officers, if not more, based on the fact that there's just gonna be less people held. Um, so you see a savings uh, net total of 683,000 that we predict out of the sheriff's office budget. And again, that's already providing for everything that we have uh, in place already under our current budget. So, uh, there's a few little nuances in this law, like the uh, the concern of pregnant detainees and how much more time it's gonna to cost to have a corrections officer sit with them at the hospital if they uh, deliver a child while in custody. Um, you see the numbers in 2019 and 2020, it's very, very rare for this to happen. Uh, going back to the last time we had one was in 2015, where we actually had a, a pregnant field female delivered while in custody. And we always provide, you've heard about the, uh, you have to provide three phone calls within a certain amount of time of arrest. We always currently provide that anyways at the jail as soon as people are brought into custody at, at no charge to them. And that's just uh, the same slide we saw before. I didn't catch that yesterday. Or am I going backwards? Yeah. Ah, there we go. I'm just, <laughs> me messing up a PowerPoint, are you kidding me? Um, so you, you see what, uh, what we're looking at as far as expenses and uh, the general fund savings that we are predicting at the sheriff's office from this from this new bill, I think that's really good news. As DuPage Sheriff's Office came in and said to expect about 15 million in additional expenses. The only unknown is that revenue impact. What's gonna happen to court security fund, bonds, and FTA. But I'm sure our circuit clerk has the answer right after the state's attorney. Thank you. The first portion, and this has already been discussed uh, by both the uh, judge, chief judge, as well as the sheriff, is the body-worn cameras. Currently, we have some departments that have body-worn cameras, and we also have squad videos. When I first started at the office, it was essentially squad videos is what we had. And so those didn't provide a significant amount of evidentiary value because usually they were parked and the incident happened somewhere else. As we got through more training, we made sure that the officers pointed them in the right direction, so it really helped in terms of our cases. So then the body-worn cameras became more prevalent, and we have police departments like the Sheriff's Department and the Elgin Police Department who've already instituted them. And just looking at those, we already know how much work it brings in because it depends on how many officers respond to a scene and how long the scene has been. I want to talk about a typical DUI. Usually a DUI would have two police officers who are responding. So you'd have the squad video and you'd also have the body cam footage. So if you're talking about just one police officer in each of those cars, you're looking at probably three hours of the body camera, three hours of the squad video times two. So that's a lot of information that you're going through. Thankfully, now our police officers write summaries of what happened, which are the police reports. So we're able to kind of look at that, but we have an ethical duty to actually go through everything as we're giving an offer, as we're preparing for trial. With having every police department in Kane County having to have body cameras, we're now increasing that from a handful of police departments now to 1,035 sworn officers 152 troopers that are in District 2 and District 15, and then the potential of the 118 corrections officers that we're now seeing are going to be body cameras. The first thing that we looked at is staffing. What do we do as prosecutors? Who will we need to have um, additional in order to review this information because this is going to increase the amount of discovery we have to review and tender? The second portion that we looked at is the storage capability, because in addition to the police departments obviously storing it, when they send it over to us, we're going to have to store it. When we then send it over to the public defender's office or to a defense attorney, they're going to have to store it. And then lastly, we also had to look at what it meant if we had to redact this information, and usually that would be for a trial. The, 
when we go to a trial, there's sometimes information that was contained in the body camera that shouldn't come in. Maybe there was a comment that was made about the defendant's criminal history, which should not come before a jury. We would have to have the technology that would have to splice that portion out. There's also the possibility, because we just have to condense it, and with an agreement with the defense attorney in the case, we may do portions of the body camera footage as opposed to spending hours upon hours where they're seeing something that is relevant versus something that is not relevant. So what we did is we took a look at staffing to start off with, and we used a number that was helpful that we found through the DuPage County presentation when they presented to their county board. And then research was done as to how much timing it really was that a person needed and how many um, new police departments or body cams. And so using a mathematical formula that I'm not going to be able to adequately explain here because I am an attorney, um, we believe, and I believe the public defender used something similar and she's gonna be a lot better at explaining this. So I'm just gonna defer to her. We believe that based on the statistics that we would need 14 new prosecutors, three new support staff and two evidence clerks along with an evidence supervisor. I wanna talk about the evidence clerks and the evidence supervisor slash administrator. The way this comes in to our office is in a variety of different systems because there is no mandate that everybody who's in Kane County has to use the same body cam company or the same computer system. So when this comes in, we are downloading it from different systems. We're having to then convert it to something that we, that's the same for all of the state's attorney's office and then sending it on to defense attorneys or public defenders. So it's very important that we have it at the front end because this is not something our support staff in general is able to do. We have the evidence custodians who are in our office who are doing that. And right now we have one person who's already overwhelmed and that is by having only a handful of people with, or police departments with body cams. So we would really need to increase um, our clerks to be able to really take that in so that we can put it in the right places. In addition to that, um, we do need new assistant state's attorneys because this is quadrupling essentially the evidence that we're going to have and the evidence that we're going to be able to review. Again, it's very important that we look at this information because we can turn this information over, but if we have no idea that somewhere on that body cam footage, there's some sort of inculpatory evidence and we are not highlighting that, looking at it for our own ethical purposes to see if we should even be going forward with the case, we are not doing our duty as prosecutors. Um, and this three new support staff is obviously because as we're doing this, we're sending out more information. We are asking for things to be redacted. We are setting more things for trial. So that's just going to increase all of the staffing that we need. Uh, what we tried to do is the idea that if we're going to hire people, we're gonna start hiring people at the lower end, not at the higher end, which is why we put down, this is the low end in terms of what the salary cost would be for everyone. The storage is unknown because that's something that's currently taken care of by the county. I um, believe that our IT department has done a really great job so far in terms of our body cams and what we have to keep. I've had many conversations with Mr. Fonsack at IT about how they do our um, technology. And one of the fascinating things that I heard is that if I'm given a body cam and I put it in our system, and then I also send that to Ms. Conant at the Public Defender's Office, we're not storing the same thing at the same amount of gigabytes or megabytes or whatever the actual technological term is. What it does is it links it back to mine so that they're actually saving space in technology. And I thought that was a very brilliant move on the part of IT um, without it compromising our ability to have her discovery separate from my discovery. So this is something that we're going to have to find out from the county as to what that means and whether or not we can even partner with different uh, police departments within St. Charles so that when, or within King County. So for example, if the St. Charles Police Department has it, maybe we share some sort of system because I'm also going to have to hold that. So why are they paying for something that we have to have as well? The second part is the redaction and presentation. Uh, we've actually found technology that would convert everything from every police department into one format, and then we'd also be able to redact it as needed. The initial cost with the training, uh, and this training would be for four people, is $27,000. And then every year after that, it would be a maintenance fee of $15,000. 
And lastly, and I know this wasn't on the last slide, if I'm going to have 14 new ASAs, three new support staff, and then four new evidence clerks, I have nowhere for them in the state's attorney's office as it is now. And I'm sure that Ms. Conant is going to echo that as uh, she discusses new support or new staff for her office. There is just no further room in the state's attorney's office. And I would be more than happy to host every single one of you and walk you around to see what it currently looks like in the office. And with the new people that we're already hiring, we're at max capacity. Uh, the second portion is this uh, concept of pretrial release. And I know that the um, chief judge has already gone through that. And I wanna talk about what that looks from the state's attorney's office perspective. The way that we do this now is uh, pretrial services through the probation department comes down and provides us with reports. So they do a lot of the work on the front end portion of it. We obviously look at every single synopsis to make sure that it's legally sufficient. We review the criminal history because at the bond hearing now, in addition to what pretrial services has already done with their risk assessment, we're making recommendations. And we're also asking for certain bond conditions. The way that we do this in our office is we actually have our misdemeanor attorneys that are out in our branch courts come over to handle the bond court because we want to give them more experience than what they currently have now. But it is something that can be handled by a person who has relatively little experience within the office. With the new requirements of what we're going to have to do, we would no longer be able to use somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience. And frankly, we would need somebody who would do this on an everyday basis. In the Safety Act, it requires that for every defendant that we're seeking to hold, we have to file a verified petition. Now, only one petition is allowed to be filed. So if we mess up on the original one and wanna go in and try to amend it, we would be prohibited by law from doing so. In addition to that, it's shifting our burden of proof to clear and convincing evidence to hold that person instead of a presumption or preponderance of the evidence, essentially which means that now it's higher than what we have been able to do before. So what we put in these reports have to be correct and they have to obviously be convincing. And the second part is there's perjury for any false statement in the petition. Now, do I believe that any single one of my prosecutors is going to be putting false information? No, but in the relative amount of short time that we get from being given a police report in the morning or a synopsis and a criminal history in the morning to the time that they're going to have to present this to a court is not a significant amount and mistakes will happen. I cannot put in prosecutors who are not able to go through the information and clearly dissect what should and should not be in there, which is why we would need some additional staffing. In addition to that, the Safety Act now requires that instead of just the synopsis and criminal history, which is what we were tendering at the bond hearing, we're supposed to be able to tender more discovery if we have it which means we're going to have more communication with the police departments. We're going to have to try to get the full report if it's already drafted so that we can then prepare it, number it, and tender it to the public defender that's in the courtroom. Uh, the Safety Act also require or allows these to be quasi-suppression hearings. So for those of you who are not the lawyers in the room, a suppression hearing could include evidence or it could include the statements. Now it's not going to effectively um, create a court order that says that this is suppressed, but the judge can take that into consideration when filing or when deciding whether or not to keep the person in custody. So if the defense attorney in the room brings up an issue saying that the evidence was collected in an unconstitutional manner or the statement was taken without the Miranda warnings being given, those are arguments that are going to be now made in a bond hearing with, again, little to no evidence that we have without having a police officer there who's going to testify about something or case law to support whatever it is that we're going to be saying and arguing. So with that being said, again, I cannot put brand new attorneys into that courtroom any longer. It has to be people who are very familiar with the law related to suppression hearings. And lastly, the law um, now allows the court to compel the complaining witness to appear. With that being said, what then does that mean? Who is serving the subpoena? Is it the sheriff's office who's doing this? Because the request for the complaining witness to appear is going to come from the defendant, not from the state's attorney's office. Are we going to have to have a court reporter there? There is a lot of information in there about how any information from a complaining witness can then be used at a later trial. It may not be able to be used in the state's case in chief, but could potentially be used as a rebuttal. In addition to that, 
we have to be cognizant of who the complaining witness is. Is this a victim in a domestic violence or a sexual assault case? Which again means I'm going to need to have a prosecutor there and more than likely an advocate there who's going to be able to help walk this victim through the system and what is happening as to the reason why they're being compelled to come talk to them during a bond hearing essentially and not anything at a trial. So we need somebody who is trained in trauma-informed victim interviewing to be in there, which again is not one of my newer assistants that I have. With that being as said, and again, looking at how we currently have our system set up, we would be looking to have a dedicated unit that deals with not only the felony review portion of it, but also this pretrial release portion of it. The felony, right now, I'm very excited to say that we have a quasi-felony review unit that started where we have two people who are dedicated to just responding to the police departments and authorizing or denying felony charges. And these are both people with experience. I have the supervisor of this unit who has over 20 years of experience having prosecuted in our office who is setting policy and procedure. I have an attorney who is a misdemeanor attorney who has done several trials and she is very experienced, um, who is the second portion of that current unit. The idea though is by adding four additional people to this unit, it will be the same six people. There will be a policy that will be in place and these will be people who are coming in with the experience of having done trials in our office to be able to handle these hearings. And so that is the cost that you see to create this type of a unit and these six individuals would then rotate through felony review and pretrial release. And the beauty of this is they're the ones who are charging the offenses, which means then when they go to the bond call, they'll already know what they're going to be putting in a verified petition to hold somebody because they'll be asking those questions during the call with the police officer. The second portion is warrants. As you know now, if somebody fails to appear for court, the state's attorney's office can ask for a warrant and the court can issue a warrant because they've been given a notice of, um, from the, day, the court day prior that they have to be in court. It is as simple as that. Usually there's a defense attorney there who's saying I have or have not had contact with my client and if I had, maybe there's a reason why they're not there. I have to tell you in looking at how Kane County works, it's not as simple as the state just asking for a warrant and a judge just issuing it. The judge actually asks questions and tries to make sure that this person isn't there for a reason that is justifiable. Now what we're going to have to do is if a person fails to appear in court, we're going to have to file what's called a rule to show cause, which is a legal document. And again, we have to prepare this legal document. We have to get it signed. We have to get it filed and we have to get it sent over to either the defendant if they're um, unrepresented or to the defense attorney. And this has to be served then on the defendant, which again is going to be an extra impact on the sheriff's department because they're the ones who are doing the service. What will then have to happen is if the defendant fails to appear for the next court date after having been successfully served with the subpoena or with the rule to show cause, then a warrant can be issued. Again, at this time, I don't really know what the cost is going to be because this is going to be done by the attorneys who are in the courts. I'm guessing that if we are able to hire the additional prosecutors just based on the whole body cam portion that that will release some of the caseload that they currently have and it'll give them the time to do this. I think we're more concerned about the sheriff's department or even our own special investigators who are going to have to be serving these rules to show cause. And the next part is going to be training. The sheriff's department or Sheriff Hain has already talked to you about what their training expectations are and the state's attorney's investigators are going to be uh, included as people who are required to have the same training. One of the ideas that we obviously have is because we have so many police departments that we work with and obviously we have the sheriff's department that we can essentially just piggyback on their training and allow them to go over there. However, what that also means is that we're, we are the ones who are providing a lot of that training too, and we've already done so. In uh, preparation for the Safety Act and uh, by being lucky enough to participate in the trailer bill discussions as I have been, we have gone to a lot of our police departments already to provide training as to what the Safety Act means and how it changes. But I have to tell you from the first part of the training in the Safety Act before the trailer bill came out, now we have to go back and train them on the new changes that have happened. So 
the best practice that we've seen is actually having a training unit within our office. And that training unit would not only provide training to police departments, which would significantly help in terms of the cost for them, but it provide training within our office as well. I have um, spent, I don't know how many countless hours now going to police departments to train them on the Safety Act, completely forgetting that I really needed to do that same training within the office. And I've been reminded a couple of times and now we're preparing that. But again, having a training department can focus on that is something that would help ease the cost for the sheriff's department and other police departments, but really also make it so that we have the best investigations that create the best prosecutions, which ultimately create justice in regards to this. Um, so before I pass the clicker officially over, I do want to say um, something that I've been lacking saying in the public is that I'm excited about a lot of stuff that's in the Safety Act training. And I know that when we came out and we talked about this, we came out and we said all of the negative stuff that happened. I'm very excited for the elimination of cash bail because I have to tell you as a longtime prosecutor now, I have seen people who stay in custody because they're able to post and they should never have. And I've said this a million times over, a rich murderer needs to stay in jail just as much as a poor murderer needs to stay in jail. And so this act has created a lot of great criminal justice reform that we're gonna be behind 100%. But I've also said it needs to be done with safety in mind. And I think that in King County, we are becoming big proponents of how to make these great changes in the right way while still doing exactly what the sponsors of this law wanted, which is to bring the criminal justice reform we've been lacking for years. So thank you. So for the public, oh. For the Public Defender's Office, um, the Safety Act impacts us in two ways, and that is the body-worn cameras and the pretrial detention. Um, so I'm going to start with the body-worn cameras. Um, as Ms. Mosser has indicated, as attorneys, we have ethical obligations um, in regards to discovery. When we receive these body-worn cameras or the squad videos, as attorneys, we are ethically obligated to watch these videos, uh, and we have to watch them from beginning to end. I think um, in past presentations, you have heard from Ms. Mosser and from myself, a lot of the issues with these, um, the videos that we receive, they can be very long, they can be, or they can be very short. So they can just last minutes or they can last hours. In um, receiving them, you can get one video for a case, or you can get 10, or you can get more. It depends upon the seriousness of the case. For a traffic stop, you may only have one video. It may only be 20 minutes long. For a murder, you could get 10 or more videos that last hours in length. One thing to keep in mind about the videos also is that oftentimes we get videos that may be an hour long and there's really only about five minutes of that that pertains to the case or is important to the case. But we still have to utilize that time to watch from beginning to end to make sure somewhere in there we haven't missed something because a lot of times that five minutes of importance comes halfway through the video. So you need to watch from beginning to end. Oftentimes attorneys have to start and stop the video multiple times to take notes or to get a closer view of the contents. So even though the video may last an hour, it may be two hours for the attorney to get through it, uh, to do proper diligence in viewing the video and to, to um, further prepare his or her case. Our support staff does download our videos. And as Ms. Mosser indicated, unfortunately, Multiple agencies have multiple video players that they use. So when uh, we, we feel at this point that we've got most of those video players uh, th with the help of IT, but when a situation occurs that it's a new video player, that stops the process of downloading. And we have to oftentimes reach out to IT to get the correct video player downloaded to our systems. So that just prolongs the process and takes additional time for our support staff, which then takes them away from other duties that they could be doing as well. I've given as part of the presentation, just an example of um, potential number of videos. For our misdemeanor domestic violence courtroom, we have three attorneys in that courtroom. As of July 6th of this year, our office had opened 454 cases in that courtroom. 
the average caseload for those three attorneys is 232 cases. Now that's just cases, that's not clients. Their average client caseload is 191. I will tell you that those numbers are much higher than pre-COVID numbers. So while this example gives you an idea of the number of videos, we are hoping to get those numbers down um, as, the, as jury trials are expanding. But if you look at, in most domestic cases, there are an average of two body cams, oftentimes more than that. Oftentimes it's about four. Um, but if you look at, if you consider that there are two body cams per case, that's an average of 464 videos per attorney that they are looking at and viewing in all the ways that I have already mentioned. So then what are our needs in regards to the body-worn cameras? And as Ms. Mosser indicated, um, we received a, a PowerPoint presentation that DuPage did, and they the formula that they relied on came out of Virginia. I will tell you that I did a lot of research to try to um, figure out what, how other states are handling this. There are six other states that have passed body-worn camera legislation. Unfortunately, of those six states, five of them have passed since May of 2020. So there is literally no research on this issue yet. There are states that are working on it now, um, but there was nothing uh, that I could use to make a comparison to our office as to what kind of staff that we would need. But the state of Virginia did pass legislation, and this is what DuPage used for their PowerPoint presentation. Their legislation indicates that for um, each, for 75 body cam cameras, you should have one additional attorney for that. Um, so adding up the number of law enforcement that we have in King County and um, dividing that by the 75. Now, our office does not is not appointed to every single case in the county. So we would not be viewing every single video of every single officer in the county. Um, so I then did kind of bring that number down um, and based upon the number of cases that we do receive. Uh, so that would be a staff of, of, of about 10 additional attorneys and then additional support staff and investigators as well as a trial technology assistant. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit further down, but that would be to help redact the videos and present them for trial. In regards to technology, um, there is a new program that has come out that I have just learned about, and it is created specifically for public defenders. It is called Justice Text, and I am setting up a demonstration for us so that I can see how it works. The cost of it is unknown at this point, but what they do um, is it is a program that you can search the video and it creates a transcript then of the video. So it would highlight key terms for you so that you would, while you still have the obligation to watch the video, this would give you an opportunity ahead of time to know um, if this is a video that actually has words in it or, or speaking, or it's just the officers walking around. Um, and in this justice text, they also help with, uh, it would allow you to redact the videos from there. As Ms. Mosser indicated, oftentimes uh, when we are preparing these videos for trial, we have to cut and paste or cut and slice. Um, so this program would help to do that. Unfortunately, at this time, I don't know the cost because we have not set up the demo yet. As Ms. Mosser indicated, space is at a premium in our offices as well. I do have areas of our office that we could turn into additional offices, um, but that would require some construction. Um, and it would also require we, as we are working on trying to purge our our files, the files that we can get rid of, uh, that would open up space in our office, but it would require some construction. Data storage is a uh, very big issue for us and is something that we have been working very diligently with IT about. 
Um, we are required to keep our files even after they close and we are required to keep them for certain amounts of time. There are some cases such as murder and certain sex cases that we can never get rid of. So we have to store those files forever. Um, in regards to misdemeanors, we can get rid of those three years after the completion of the sentence and for other felonies other than murder and sex cases, it is five years after the completion of the sentence. So data storage is an issue because when we are keeping these cases, it is not just for the period that we are working on the files, it is for many years after those cases close. I've given you an example which IT graciously gave to me um, and I will not be able to explain it to you because I am not a computer person, but this is the example of how much storage that we are using currently. Uh, they are adding about 500 gigabytes of space to our server about every two weeks at this point in time. And um, that is at the point that not all of our agencies are using body worn cameras. Uh, so that number will certainly increase once this law goes into effect. Then moving on to the pretrial release, as Ms. Mosser indicated, these the hearings for detention will be much more in depth than the bond hearings that we do now. As she indicated, um, as it stands right now, we can have any attorney in our office go down and do bond call. Uh, it is just a, the preparation for that is reviewing the synopsis that the state presents to us. And a synopsis is just a very brief summary of what happened in the case at the point as at the point of the arrest. So this, a, a synopsis can be a paragraph, it can be two pages, but it's not the depth of discovery that you get as the case moves on. So it's very easy to read that prior to the hearing and then be prepared for the hearing. Additionally, as part of our bond hearings right now, we are looking at the public safety assessment that court services provides to us. When this law goes into effect, that will change. All of those hearings have to be held in person and an attorney must have access to his client prior to the hearing. We currently staff bond call seven days a week, 365 days a year. So we have attorneys there all of the time. Currently because of COVID, we are not meeting with our clients ahead of time. Uh, so that will change as part of this bill. As Ms. Mosser indicated, she has an obligation to tender us much more discovery upfront than what we receive right now. So that will require preparation on the part of the attorney. And as she indicated there, we can argue the legality of the arrest and collection of evidence at this detention hearing. So that is going to require that we have attorneys down here that have more experience to be able to pick out those issues and be able to articulate those issues at the detention hearing. So unfortunately, we probably would not be able to put brand new attorneys in this courtroom any longer. As part of the pretrial release hearing, the state that Judge Hall spoke to you about the net of offenses that can lead to a detention hearing. There is that, and then the state must show that there is a threat to a specific person as part of requesting detainment. That may require us to send out our investigators to talk to these witnesses. Um, our investigators may also have to go out uh, to look at the scene as regards to the legality of the arrest and any issues that we are raising in regards to that as well. That is not something that we do at this point as part of our bond, bond hearings because we don't have all of that information at the time of the bond hearing. The other issue that will be new as part of these detention hearings is that um, when a person is arrested, he is entitled to three phone calls at the, he actually is entitled to three phone calls at each detention place. So if he is arrested by the Aurora police, he gets three phone calls there. If he is then moved to the sheriff to be detained, he gets three phone calls there. At each of the police agencies as part of this legislation, the public defender's telephone number has to be posted uh, so that anyone arrested could uh, see our telephone number and 
could make phone calls to us. So that will be a change for us as well. We do, we do not currently get phone calls um, hardly ever from any of our clients that have been arrested, uh, but the, them having access to this, I believe will greatly increase the phone calls that we receive from individuals that have been detained. Ms. Conant, before you, I just want to note a time requirement on that as well. So the statute indicates that we have to, from the time the state files the petition, if it's a misdemeanor, the hearing has to be held within 24 hours. And on the felony, it has to be held within 48 hours. So although we do have bond call right now, seven days a week, 365 days a year, that bond call, we track that typically lasts on the weekend, maybe an hour to an hour and a half. What this is going to, if those timelines stay, and we're asking for the, the legislature to amend those to give us more time, but the lengthy hearings that we're talking about will have to take place on Saturdays and Sundays, which will change bond call from a, 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 an hour to two hours, depending on the offense. Now we could be talking about a full day of court on Saturday and Sunday, which of course will then ripple on security circuit clerk, PD, state's attorney, uh, judicial. So again, that's something that we're trying to work with the legislature on, but as it exists, 24 to 48 hours, depending on the class of offense. And that is a very good point because that goes to our staff needs. Um, we, I believe that we would need two dedicated attorneys to handle these detention hearings. Right now we, in our office, we do a rotation. Uh, each attorney in the office is given a week to two weeks um, a year that they have to go and be a part of bond call. But they do that while they have their own caseloads too. As indicated uh, through Ms. Mosser and myself, the amount of preparation that would take to be ready for these hearings is just not something that they would be able to do while managing their own caseload uh, because we do require that when they do their week of bond call, they are supposed to clear their other cases so that they can just do bond call. That would just be very difficult, if not impossible to do with the amount of work that we think is going to now be entailed as part of these hearings. And again, um, these the attorneys that we dedicate to this courtroom would most likely not be able to be brand new attorneys because of the legal issues that are now going to have to be argued in this courtroom. And then we would be asking for, we believe that we would need um, an additional investigator for this courtroom uh, to do the in scene investigation and to talk to the potential witnesses involved. Again, there are the space issues as far as our office um, and furnishings needed for new attorneys. Um, and then in regards to um, the phone calls that the inmates can make, that may require us to get new cell phones for different attorneys and cell phone plans as well. Just on the bottom. Yep. The bottom one is the go forward. Uh, the, no, no, no. You're right there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, my part of this isn't quite as lengthy as the um, others that have been here, but uh, I just wanted to show you the financial side of it because that's basically um, part, well, that's pretty much the majority of our office other than uh, compiling all the documentation for all these cases that will be coming forward. Okay. This slide um, shows the bail analysis from 2019. Now, this is the revenue that the uh, that King County brings in for cash bail, just cash bail. And if you see um, in our pie chart to the right, it has broken down all of the uh, fines in court costs that go out throughout King County. The largest portion um, in orange is the amount paid to the county 
uh, the county clerk's office, the circuit clerk's office, and all the local agencies throughout the county. You, if you notice, that's sixty-five percent of that um, of cash bail. So that is revenue that comes in through cash bail that would go to these other entities along with ourselves in a total of six million seven hundred twenty-two thousand. Now this is from twenty nineteen. I wanted to let everybody know that the revenue that we that the county collects from cash bail um, is distributed to 479 other local agencies throughout the county. That's other municipalities, villages, police stations, et cetera, that would receive funds from the cash bail revenue that we would collect, that we would, will not be able to collect. These are uh, the sections of the legislation that explain the deposit of bail security. And it's just kind of a breakdown of what the previous slide showed um, with the elimination of cash bail. 10% um, as earned has been repealed. So the earned bond uh, the county that goes into the county's general fund for revenue is 530,717. That's just from the circuit clerk's office. That's just our portion of the revenue that's put into the general fund. That's an average of 6,900 cases for 2019. The elimination of bond forfeiture and judgment of forfeiture to the local agencies um, out of that um, amount and out of that 10% is 92,660. Now we have uh, different, we, we with the elimination of the 75, a uh, dollar warrant fee, $70 is paid to the agency that arrested a defendant on a warrant and $5 is paid to the circuit clerk's operation and admin fund. Doesn't seem like a lot, but for one year, uh, the warrants paid to law enforcement agencies is 95,000 and the sheriff's portion alone was 50,000, little over 50,000. Our portion for one year would be 31,000. This is the section of legislation regarding the Illinois Vehicle Code. Um, and to try and uh, summarize this for all of us, when a person uh, is stopped by a police officer, if they receive a, a ticket, they are, um, many times they turn over their driver's license. So, <laughs> In order to get their driver's license back, they would come into our office and pay for their pay their fine, and receive their get their driver's license back. But with this legislation, we will not be able to the police officers, law enforcement, will not be able to uh, collect their driver's license. So therefore, um, what is going to be the incentive to pay off your your fine if you do not have to come in to collect your driver's license? A lot of our fines and fees ends up in collections. And um, it's unfortunate that we would have to go this route, but some folks don't have the funds and other folks neglect to pay the funds. So uh, this is a route that we have to take. Now with um, the absence of having to collect their driver's license, that is only going to increase. And uh, it takes years to collect um, on back pay uh, funds that are due. It takes years for our uh, collection agency to track people down. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's something that I don't think the state took into consideration when they created some of these um, portions of the Safety Act, because this, the judicial system will have to be uh, totally funded by the county or by the state, which the state has put it onto us now as the county to fund the judicial system. And it will not all come from the revenue collected from those that are in the judicial system. So between um, 2017 and 2019, 
we collected a uh, failure to pay between $7,298,327. That's over a three year period in failure to pay. So that's a considered amount of money that are, or a revenue that we will uh, potentially be missing. Also in the, um, in the legislation, we will need to do some uh, programming changes in the clerk's office that's with our case management system. Uh, every time uh, Mr. Shepro made a good um, comment that someone received their, um, their information for jury duty and it did say to wear a mask, Every time a uh, some uh, a new statute is is made effect or a general order comes down, sometimes we have less than 24 hours to uh, get the information into the system and change paperwork, what have you, for individuals, and that's when uh, things start to kind of fall through the cracks. So we're always working 24/7 on making those changes. Um, in the failure to pay and satisfaction of failure to pay reporting to the Secretary of State, um, that was repealed, but the $75 warrant fee to agency that's repealed and the 30 day, um, the $30 a day credit for time served has been repealed. So in all our analysis and programming, we kind of did it a little, we didn't want to go too huge with this because we didn't want to look like you know, we need 20 people to do this, but it, I, I just used two of our programming programmers at the cost of 54,000. So that's kind of what we, we uh, thought would be required just for this bill. Um, and then 78,000 for support staff, that would be two employees um, starting out at 39. But that is not what all of our employees start out. As you know, they start out at 29. So this is just a five-year um, anticipation of what uh, those just those few employees would cost the circuit clerk's office um, and, and dip into the revenue stream that the county will be um, will not be receiving due to the safety act. I just wanted to add that there's a lot of good in the safety act, just as the state's attorney has um, said, but there's a, there's many things in the safety act that I don't think our legislators took into consideration um, what this will cost the taxpayers of Kane County alone. Um, this is, this will be revenue that we will be, we will have a shortfall on on uh, something we need to look at going forward. Uh, we all have um, ideas on how, what we'll need to do to operate the Safety Act correctly. And there is a lot of reporting. There is a lot of um, statistics that we will need to compile. We will need employees for that. And as you all know, we're all short on employees. So that's my portion of it. Um, just, I think one more click. And so just before, before we turn it over for questions, I just, a couple things that I want to finish with is one, each of us uh, in our own areas, circuit clerk, state's attorney, public defender, chief judges conference, uh, our organizations are in contact with our legislators and we are trying to ask them to make amendments to what you've seen so that it better reflects and allows us to run our systems more efficiently and effectively. So I know as a county board, you're familiar with this, the state dictates to you how to do something and it doesn't necessarily work the same in every county. So all of us are working uh, on that portion and that's why we're very hopeful. The legislators have been receptive to receiving trailer bills. So our hope is we're gonna continue to see some changes that might address some of this. Um, from the conference of chief judges perspective, and I know it's the same, but one of the biggest issues that everybody's hit on is um, we are asking, we're saying, if you're going to, if you're going to take away these revenue streams and you're going to add all these additional responsibilities, then you as a state need to give us more money to do what you're asking us to do. 
you can't take away all the take take away all the revenue and and their ideas are great and they're laudable and and they're well intentioned but they're taking money away that that other counties including our own have relied upon to run our systems so as i know you guys have a, leg, uh, a lobbyist we have a lobbyist for the conference of chief judges we're continuing that's going to be one of the biggest focuses in this next year which is if you're going to do this fantastic but you need to be able to give us the money that it's going to take to do this and if not we're not exactly sure how we're going to effectuate all the intentions, uh, how, how we're going to do it. And that's the, the, you know, the challenge that we're going to go forward. So, so chairman Molina and the rest of the committee, I know that, I know that it was a long presentation, but everybody took a lot of time to look through it. We're willing to answer questions today or in the future. And we want to let you know that we certainly think about this through the county's eyes. We understand and appreciate the support you've always given us. Um, we just, as you had said, want to give you a little bit of some foresight as to what's coming um, so that we can try to prepare for it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, any comments or questions regarding Madam the presentation? Chair. Mr. Leonard? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for the presentation today. It was very thorough, very complete, and I think very accurate and in some respects conservative. Uh, in looking at the different departments and the needs, which I feel are all necessary, I don't see any need anyone's asked for that isn't necessary. Um, I look at about a $5 million a year additional expense. You know, with reduced revenues, additional expenses, how do we handle that on a year to year basis? I guess what I'm asking all of you to do is to please uh, talk to whoever you can in the county and ask them to set money aside for the next eight to 10 years to the amount of maybe eight to 10 million a year to cover these expenses. Then we can hire the people that we so desperately need. And because we can only increase our property tax revenue by a million dollars a year, if we don't do that in two, three years, we're gonna be in a position where we can not only maintain these new hires, but we're gonna to have to reduce. So I think it's very, very critical that we all realize we have to take this rescue money and allocate it over an eight to 10 year period so that we can handle the expenses that are so desperately needed by all of you. Thank you. Thank you, well, Mr. Chair, Shepra. Uh, I would echo Mr. Leonard's comments. Uh, I can only imagine the amount of time that went into you all preparing this presentation, but I, I agree this is really critical uh, and, uh, as it was suggested, uh, necessary and a little scary to me. Um, I got pages of questions, and I, I don't know that anybody wants to listen to all of them, but in listening to the presentation again uh, and again, the same thing came through to me. Even if we had money sitting around to be spent on this, virtually every one of you said, we need experienced people to do these things. And so I guess my collective question to everybody is, um, where are we going to find these people? I suspect that there are not these dozens and dozens of experienced people who are simply waiting to be transferred into a, a uh, new position. Uh, and I know that there are delayed effective dates for some of this, but uh, it seems to me that the finding those people and competing with everybody else that will be wanting to hire the same people uh, is a staggering personnel challenge. And uh, I just wonder how uh, any of you, the presenters thoughts are as to how we deal with it. And one extra comment uh, two extra comments is, as you know, the administration committee has been wrestling with the long range plan for buildings. Uh, and it seems pretty clear that the existing uh, physical facilities are not going to be able to accommodate all of these extra people in any kind of um, meaningful way. Uh, I, I would encourage people to take a look at some of the facilities we have and realize just how crowded they are. And uh, for the chief judge, uh, is this going to necessitate 
additional judges to deal with all these extra weekend uh, or even daily bond calls. So uh, that's a lot. But uh, again, I want to thank everybody for so much good information about what the real cost of this is. And one last editorial comment. A lot of people have tried to politicize this bill, uh, but I think it's clear from the comments that were made that not only does it do many good things, uh, you know, um, when it comes to facilities and, and staff and so forth, I, I don't know that there's a partisan issue there. These are people that are going to be needed. And uh, uh, again, where do we find them? Thank you. Could I just, just as the old guy in the room, when I look at now I'm part of these meetings with Ms. Conant, Ms. Mosser, uh, I find mm -hmm. myself being in a position I haven't been, uh, which is the person that's the oldest and been here the longest. But with that being said, I think, Ken, to your point about staff, um, as a former first assistant and someone who's been around the office, I think the way that we do this is that we have fantastic prosecutors and public defenders and, and probation officers who have done a great job, who are ready to get moved up into supervisory and these extra positions. I think where we would get those is it would be from uh, moving up people that we already have and then hiring new people. So, um, but again, I'm just going to go back to the fact that we have excellent attorneys here and uh, that's uh, a testament to, to everybody here. But uh, that's the way I think that the staffing issue is done. Um, as to the need for another judge that, uh, or more judges, as you know, that would be on the state level, but we're certainly advocating and possibly expecting that. But that brings me to the last point, which is what you had said, is there's no more courtrooms to put them into. So, uh, you know, I appreciate Chris Allen and the board doing a master plan and looking at that. Um, as Ms. Mosser said, we, we welcome, you don't need to walk through our buildings to know the issue, but it, you're always invited to. And if you do, you'll see that there's just unfortunately not any additional space. So um, that's a short answer, I hope. I think the Thank you. point also is that coordination among our committees on this issue is, is going to be, you know, critical. You know, we can come back and say, we recommend you know, 25 or 30 new people, uh, but the administration committee is then going to have to figure out how to deal with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Ms. Mosser? Thank you. I just want to address two things. Uh, one, Mr. Leonard, one of the things that we decided as a group to do is not only come to say this is all the resources and money that we need, but to do a little research into where that could come from. I've told you from the beginning, I love the plan with the ARA money, with spreading it out, not spending it all at once. But we've also identified other revenue sources that we're hoping to present to the finance committee so that there's we're coming with a solution in addition to an ask. And so together, we've been talking about that. The research is done. I have to share it with my colleagues here, and we will bring that to all of you with a hopeful solution, too. And then secondly, to Mr. Shepro's point, uh, Chief Judge Hall is right. We have fantastic attorneys here, and the idea is to move people up and give people this. But we have also have an opportunity now that we haven't really had before. I cannot tell you how many people I know who want to be prosecutors, but in what's going on with their life, they may not be able to. Having something like a felony review unit where they can work from home, for example, is going to allow people to do that. One of the people in my felony review unit was talking to us because she was potentially going to have to quit because she had her fourth child. And having put three kids through daycare myself and having worked at the state's attorney's office during that time period, it becomes impossible. We were able to put her in the felony review unit so I keep a great prosecutor. She gets to stay home with her family. She doesn't have to do the daycare route but we can be creative in terms of how we do that and actually get people to our respective offices where it used to be you had to be there 8.30 to 4.30 because we have court. There's no other option of what you have. Now we have a possibility of doing something else and getting great people who have different situations in life and be able to hire them for these positions. So that's one of the things we're looking at in terms of the future for employment. Thank you. And again, um, thank you, everyone. I think this was kind of our the beginning um, discussion, again, on, on how we are going to see our judicial partners in the future. Um, and, you know, we're looking at the Great Recession of 2021, where um, 
people are resigning their jobs or they're leaving the workforce. And I think we have to figure out creative ways of bringing them back. And just like you mentioned, I mean, these are gonna be creative ways of bringing people back into the workforce. Um, so I think we're gonna continue this discussion. This is just the beginning. Um, thank you so much for all your time and effort into putting um, this presentation together. Um, it will be available to all the county board members. Um, so I'm hoping that this will be emailed to everybody today so that we have something to look at. Um, any further questions or comments regarding the presentation today? Okay, so let's um, go ahead and move on. We still have some um, business to take care of. So um, Judge Hall, you did have a, um, a resolution. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Naughton. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I, we're bringing a resolution authorizing a IT position for the courts. This position would be funded by fees that have been collected uh, for the past year. Uh, what we are looking at, we've had preliminary uh, discussions with IT, with Roger and Charles Lasky. The honest truth of the matter is we don't have enough work at judiciary for this person to be full time. But if we share this with IT uh, and store and put this person at the courthouse because we do have a secret, we've hidden away one conference room from the rest of the departments that they don't know about. This is where we would put that person. Uh, that person could be available to serve the or service the other departments at the courthouse. Roger and Charles will tell you 60 to 70% of their work product goes to support the offices, offices that report to this committee. So if there was an issue with the civil state's attorney or with one of the clerks in one of the courtrooms, this individual could go deal with that, that solution. The money is there. I'm glad Erica is here because we've worked with Erica. We've got about $101,000 in that fund that we have collected so far for this fiscal year. We're only asking for about 90,000. The issue being, we haven't had a normal month for filing fees in the last 18. So I can't really guarantee you that that fund, funding stream will be there. We're pretty sure it will be, but we also have some other areas that we'd like to address as well. So I'm more than willing to entertain any questions you have and I ask for your approval. Okay, I'll, I'll ask for a motion and second to um, discuss and potentially approve. Leonard so moves. moves. Gums will uh, Leonard moves and Gums seconds. Okay, any comments or questions regarding this resolution? Madam Chair. Mr. Brown? The only question I have is the other day in the budget meeting, the first budget meeting that the county board was our participant in, um, Roger was talking in IT about the need for six additional people for his team. Is this one that you're talking about gonna be into addition to his six or a part of? It would be in addition to, uh, simply put, we're not sure. I think this is a halftime position for me, but the, the issue is also that public defender doesn't have an, I really have a full-time IT person to serve the courthouse, neither does the state's attorney. So essentially what it would do is it would free up a half time for Roger because whenever something goes wrong at the courthouse, he's got to send somebody from building B to go up the street. Okay, thank you. Mr. Leonard. And just to piggyback on that, Madam Chair, I think um, what Mr. Naughton is explaining to us on the board is um, Roger has six people he wants to add. This would be an addition and it would come out of the judiciary budget. That is correct. We would so oversee the budget. It would not be the IT budget. So thank you very much for that explanation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Shepro? Uh, I seem to recall that Roger had an ask for, I think it was five and a half or six and a half. And I asked, where's the other half? And I think this is the other half person. <laughs> yep. I think you're right. Because yeah. he said it would be coming out of a different, uh, you know, different pot. Erica, sorry, go ahead. I did actually speak with Roger um, about this particular thing uh, in order to do the proper budget adjustment. And this is that I don't believe that's where the other half person is coming from. I believe that half person is staying within his department in IT and one of his other funds. Okay. okay, thank you for the clarification. Any other questions or comments regarding this resolution? 
Okay, hearing and seeing then this resolution will move on to finance. Um, if I can have a motion. Oh, I have a motion in a second. Okay, if I can have roll call, please. Brown? Yes. Gums? Gums, yes. Leonard? Leonard, yes. Sanchez? Sanchez, yes. Shepro? Shepro, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next item on our agenda is our Court Services Administration. Good morning. Our um, monthly report is on file along with the JJC housing report. I do have an emergency affidavit, um, purchase affidavit on the agenda today due to um, an issue with the fence at the JJC. Many of you have been over to the JJC, you know, as a part of our care for the children, we do give them rec time. The fence was pretty much leaning over and some of the posts were coming from the, the ground and foundation. So we had to get that fixed as soon as possible, necessitating spending um, $32,000. So I have before you that purchase affidavit to transfer um, fees from salary and wages into capital. Okay, thank you. I might have a motion and a second to discuss and uh, potentially approve this resolution. Brown, Brown moves. Mr. Brown moves. Leonard seconds. Mr. Leonard seconds. Any questions or comments? Okay, if I can have roll call, please. Brown? Yes. Gums? Yes. Leonard? Leonard, yes. Sanchez? Sanchez, yes. Chepro? Chepro, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And this will move on to our finance committee this month or next month. Um, okay, uh, and next item on our agenda is our circuit clerk. Hello again, um, my report is on file. So if anyone has any questions regarding that, I would, would like to mention that we are still uh, struggling to find employees, new employees. Uh, we, I, I did hear at the human service meeting, which I misspoke, thought it was admin the other day, that uh, we had 10 new applicants but everyone knows maybe we'll get one out of those um, that is a viable candidate to work in the circuit clerk's office. We have, since we have raised the minimum wage to $15 an hour, we have seen less applicants, which is very strange, but um, I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, assuming that we're like everybody else in the country trying to find employees. Uh, so we're all struggling with that. Um, I am putting banners on our parking lot today that says we are now hiring. So hopefully we will get some more employees. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it right now. We're just struggling trying to fill the slots. Our criminal division is still down, I believe, four people. And um, our civil division is down two. So we're still struggling to fill the office. But we're plugging along and um, very happy that we'll do half and half uh, with the Zoom through the courts so that, because we do have employees that are, are working two courtrooms at a time. That's it. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Barrero. Any questions um, regarding our circuit clerk's report? Okay, thank you again. Um, okay, so we will move on to our merit commission. Do I have someone here from merit commission? I'm not your normal face here. Uh, Todd Zeese is now a full-time bailiff at the Third Street Courthouse, so mm -hmm. I guess I'm your new guy. My name is Peter Burgert, B-U-R-G-E-R-T. Uh, I'd like to get a little timeline on things because we're going to have some increases too, certainly not in the millions. But when I started in 2016, when we advertised for both corrections and deputies, we had to limit it, the number of applicants to 300 because we had no place to test that would hold any more. We had lines out the door out here at seven o'clock in the morning that stretched for 200 people. We presently have 13 applications for a July 28th test for corrections. We're testing every three months for corrections Patrol deputies went from about 300 in 2016 to a list that we gave the sheriff in the middle of June to 87. That list, because fewer people leave the sheriff's office than they do, or the deputy side, than they do the correction side, that list is usually and will probably be good for two years. 
But like I said, we're already going to test July 28th. We have 14 applications. What we did for the June deputy test was contact the five people or about 20 people who failed the test, but failed it within five points. And we offered them the opportunity to, to apply for corrections without taking a test, without paying a fee for the application, and without even, only with having to have an oral interview with us. I think we have seven of those people that have said, said that they would take the test. Whether they do or not, I don't know. But I say that to say this, we're gonna be testing again, most likely in November for corrections, because if we only have 14 or 15 on the list, uh, probably a third don't get through a quick background check or the psych test. So the sheriff will be left with another list, probably single digits. So anyway, we're going to open, we have in the past, about a year ago, opened up lateral transfers on a monthly basis to corrections. We've never advertised for that before, but we're, we're at our coming up July 27th meeting with the sheriff, we're gonna discuss which costs $300 a month to advertise for lateral transfers to corrections only, which, which would be a monthly thing, uh, which would be $3,600 a year. Our budget for advertising as we speak is $500. So obviously there'll be an increase there. The fortunate, the good thing is I, although I miss seeing him on a several days a week is Todd is nowhere near his per diem limits or even half of it. And he's turning in nothing for mileage. So there, that money will most likely be shifted at some point in, in the future to advertising. But other than that, uh, that's the bad news. And you have a, that resolution, which you need discussion on. I, I don't know if that's up to you. Okay, yeah, if I can have a motion and a second to discuss the resolution authorizing uh, fiscal year 21 budget adjustment for the retroactive increase. Leonard Moose. Gums, a second. I have a, a motion made by Mr. Leonard and second by Ms. Gums. Okay. Um, can I have some discussion or can you um, introduce this resolution for us, please? Well, quite frankly, the secretary uh, failed, didn't for, remember to turn in the necessary form to the payroll folks uh, for the last three years for her 2% pay raise. So finance, somehow caught that, brought it to her attention, and evidently her back pay is $3,500. Okay, um, any comments or questions regarding the resolution? Okay, it's pretty straightforward. So, okay, if I can have um, roll call on this resolution. Brown? Yes. Gums? Yes. Leonard? Leonard, yes. Sanchez? <clears throat> Sanchez, yes. Shepro? Okay, and this passes and uh, moves on to our finance committee. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, uh, next item on our agenda is our coroner's report. Mr. Russell, good morning. Okay, I guess I didn't realize that I was already not, uh, unmuted. So I muted and now I unmuted again. Anyways, um, good morning, everyone. Um, just wanted to let you know my, our, that our reports are on file. Um, as you can see, our COVID deaths are way down uh, from last year at this time, uh, which is a, a, a praise, a good thing, uh, obviously. Um, so we, yeah, it's it's been a, it's been a tough year, uh, but through it all, we've we've uh, praised the fact that we have a new place to work out of, and we're really enjoying it. Uh, yesterday, I had a went out on a very um, bad decamp call and was able to come home, come to the uh, office, take a shower, change my clothes. Uh, it was very, I, I thank each and every one of you for allowing that to happen because it was, 
it was much a better situation than, you know, we've had to deal with, deal with in the past. So, um, secondly, um, we are in the process of compiling and actually not compiling, but finalizing our 2020 annual report. Typically our final numbers don't even come in until March because we're waiting for, um, the protocols from the doctors and tox and that type of thing. And then April, we compile the data, um, may we scrub the data to make sure everything is, you know, correct. Um, and typically I, I want to be able to have the final numbers out by June. Um, however, th this year we had a, a, a big, uh, uh, issue in the fact that we had to move the entire office from one place to another. So it kind of put us behind a little bit, but we are right there, uh, with, with this annual report, I expect to be coming out in the next week, week or so. So that's uh, a good thing. So we can kind of look at those numbers. Um, obviously, I told you earlier, you know, that we were up in our deaths, um, including COVID. That number overall is about 24%. So we are up from 2019 to 2020, um, 24%, uh, which is significant. Um, many of those, obviously, deaths um, are natural, which we consider COVID deaths to be natural. However, many of them were not. Uh, there were other deaths that were up. For instance, our opioid deaths were up 16% from last year. Um, and also, it's, it's important to note that in, what you'll see in the annual report is that I don't only just I don't only track the um, the deaths that occurred directly from opiates, but I also um, track um, the number of deaths that have opioids in their system. So, for instance. Someone may have died in a car crash or may have died uh, of a natural cause, but they were had an illicit substance in their system, an illicit opiate, not ones that are prescribed. But I think that, that what that does is that tracks the extent of the issue. I still, um, still focus on the actual deaths that occur directly from opiates, and I, and I publish those numbers as well. But I think it's important that the public uh, and, and the committee see that just because you know, the, the deaths may be this number. There's also this number of people that had it in their system and may have eventually passed from it. But it's just, it's a, it's a good number to know. But if you just look at directly of the deaths that were uh, caused directly from opiates, that number is 16% up. We had 64 people in 2020 pass away uh, from opioid deaths. Um, Overall, our natural deaths, as I had mentioned, are up 24%. Our accidental deaths are up 10%. Um, another thing that affects our budget tremendously is unclaimed bodies. Now, these are, these are people and decedents that we know who they are. We, we don't have any unidentified people. Um, but we, we either haven't been able to identify or find next of kin or those that we find just walk away and they say, well, we're, we're not going to do anything. So we're forced to, we have to gain uh, uh, permission from, from the next of kin if they choose not to, to claim. We, we gain permission to cremate, we cremate. Obviously that's an expense uh, from, the, from, from our office. So um, that's up 178%. So for some reason, people are not claiming their loved ones. Uh, we had 25 people uh, back in 2020 that just walked away said, you know, we're not going to claim the body. We're just, it's your problem now. And it's very sad. It's a very sad situation. Um, so, yeah, another, another um, thing that's kind of concerning me is, and actually that's this year, is that our homicides are up. Um, we, obviously 2019 was a, a, a different kind of year where we had the, uh, the uh, Aurora uh, the Aurora shootings, and we, we had 17 uh, total, uh, excuse me, 19 total homicides. So if you were to subtract the six from that, we'd really normally tre be trending 13. So it, although it was 19, if we didn't have um, the Aurora shootings, we would have had uh, 13. Well, this uh, 2020, we had 16. So actually, uh, numbers-wise, we went down from 19 to 20, but it's not based on um, a, a trend that was based on an anomaly that, that occurred. The trend is continuing to uh, venture upward. We, in 2021, have already, we're, we've recorded nine homicides already. 
So um, we're yeah, obviously we're, we're trending in the wrong direction here. Uh, the, the violence seems to be spreading uh, from the city out to here, and and it's a uh, it's a shame. Uh, it's and it's it's frightening to be quite honest. Um, also, the cases that are receiving investigations, obviously that's up 24%. But another number we're looking at is the bodies that are transported by KCCO, which that number is up 29%. So there are people, people aren't choosing funeral homes right away. I mean, this may be a, just a, a clear cut death that we're dealing with. Um, we really, you know, have no need to do any further investigation, but we've got nobody to claim the body. So we have to pick those bodies up and bring them back. We can't leave them in the county. So um, that number, we had 448 total bodies that we removed, you know, from the, uh, from the county and to the morgue. Um, our autopsies are up. And obviously all of our autopsies that we, um, that I order are based on national uh, standards. They're based on, you know, we just don't flip a coin. These are the, there's some factors that we take into account. And if, if there's several occasions where I could have done an autopsy and I didn't, I thought we could do it from records and I, I stand by that, but um, our autopsies are up 30%. So we went from 254 in 2019 to 2020 doing 330. So those are obviously, that's a very, uh, those, that's an expense. It's huge. It's a huge, we are getting close now. And I know this sounds kind of crazy, but um, we're getting close to a, a full-time forensic pathologist might be the, the way to go. Um, you know, I have to get some numbers from, from Rich Jorgensen over in DuPage, but you know, when you, when you're talking 330 autopsies in a year, I mean, I think the threshold is typically right around 300 where you start to go down um, in, in expenses by, by having a full timer as opposed to paying per autopsy. So we're looking heavily into that um, to see uh, what we can do, uh, if that's going to be a viable option or not. Um, let's see. So, yes. So that's where we're at with, with our numbers. Um, this will be published obviously soon within the next week or so. Um, people have a chance to uh, uh, review them and ask questions and, and whatnot. Lastly, um, I want to um, bring into the um, arena, I guess you could say, is the fact that, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about the body cameras and whatnot. And, you know, one of the discussions that came up from downstate was through the coroner's association was that, you know, we are considered peace officers. And are we going to have to wear body cameras? That's something that we're looking at. Um, you know, then we, and I would ask my judicial partners to please look into that because if you look at, you know, 55 ILCS 53,007 is that we are defined as a peace officer. So, I mean, if all of the different intricacies and challenges um, that are occurring with our other judicial partners, it, you know, we may need to, uh, we may need to mirror that. So, uh, but I, you know, we're going to obviously need some um, legislative guidance on that. And, uh, um, you know, because that could be a problem. I mean, many of the, many of the statements that we use, um, you know, in our cases um, go on, you know, if somebody it goes, goes on to the prosecution, goes on to the defense and, you know, we, we may need, we, we may have to wear them at this point. So, um yeah, that's a big concern, and I would I would uh, encourage. We are downstate, you know. We've we've got a lobbyist as well, and looking into that. But I think we, we need to look at that on on the uh, on the uh, local level as well. So that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, uh, Coroner Russell. Um, I had a quick question. Um, when you mentioned the, on uh, the bodies that you have that uh, nobody is claiming, um, when. Um, when that happens, is there any type of um, financial aid assistance information that's given to families or that's available at the coroner's office? I know, um, I mean, you constantly see these GoFundMe pages for, you know, people who die because there is no money to, to bury their loved ones. Um, I'm not sure if there's, I know some townships offer some type of financial assistance, but I'm not sure, um, Coroner Russell, is that something that is out there for our residents? Not, not in, not in mass quantities. I mean, there are, there are significant, uh, there are little, there are little incidents where that is the case. 
Uh, we deal directly, and we only have the authority to, to deal directly with the next of kin. So once we deal with it, we're talking to the next of kin. I mean, it's kind of their responsibility to either do a GoFundMe or find somebody to help do a GoFundMe. Um, you know, we've reached out. The townships really don't have any money. The state is paying really slowly, you know, uh, if they pay at all. Um, you know, it used to be that the guardian uh, would fund that and the public guardian, and, you know, they're not really doing that anymore. So, and if they, if they, there are certain occasions where they do, but um, I can't tell you what the, what the uh, codifiers are of why some do and some don't, but when they, if, and when they do, it's so, it takes so long that, you know, we, we can't hold the body that long. We, um, we have to do the best we can to, fr to try next of kin. And if we can't find any next of kin, we obviously take samples and hold it. And then we, you know, we wait a certain pe period of time, publish it in the paper, and then we cremate. So, cause we just simply don't have room to store bodies. And, um, then, you know, every other year I've got, I'll have one coming up this fall. Uh, we do a, a burial, you know, a, um, a nice burial for, for those folks that haven't been claimed. And, uh, that's where I'm utilizing the townships is uh, uh, St. Charles Township specifically uh, to put them into a crypt. And then that way they're at least they, people can go on, find a grave and hopefully find loved ones um, later on. If someone is, you know, Hey, I were, ever wonder what happened to Aunt Sally. And then they look on find a grave and find out that she's there. They can claim her at a certain time, but we do that about every other year and we're, we're stacking up. So I got to get that done this fall. So um one of the first things I did when I took over was, you know, make sure we didn't have lots of people on my shelves. Well, we're right back to where we are. So I got to take care of that again, where we were. Um, so yeah, there, there are certain things out there. We, we ask, um, you know, different organizations and whatnot, but for the most part, we can't really, it's, it's up to the next of kin to do that. Okay. Thank Thanks, you, Jenny. Mr. Shepro. Uh, go ahead, Rob, to the chair's question, I guess, um, is the, is there, is it that people don't respond at all or they respond and say, we don't want the body. And in that case, are you in a position to offer them, uh, or either some of the services you've mentioned or to, for example, explain if they say we can't afford a funeral, my impression is, is that cremation uh, can be substantially less expensive. Are there things that you can do or are allowed legally to do in terms of providing that kind of counseling? Absolutely. And when we do, um, each one of our my deputies and, and basically the chief is the one who kind of kind of comes in at the last minute and just, you know, really tries to find out where people are at and try to help them, you know, move on to the next level. Cause I think most people want to claim their loved ones. There are those that really, and I can just honestly tell you that they just want to walk away uh, for whatever reason. And, and the reasons are, there's a myriad of, of reasons why that happens. Um, many of the above, which you had mentioned. Um, but yes, we do. There's cremation society of Illinois um, that's an option. We give them that number. Um, obviously we are not a funeral home, so we, we don't, we can't do the disposition of the body, but, um, and then we get into the, you know, the touchy issue of, you know, who, who gets what and what do we pay and all that. So we just, that's not a realm we want to walk into. Um, but we, we do help them as much as we can, you know, by giving them, uh, options. Um, you know, some people have a real problem with cremation. So, you know, there's not much if there's not much we can do about that, but um, yeah. As I recall, uh, do you not have the authority? Although I think you have to go through some legal process. If the decedent has assets, that can be used to fund, uh, you know, an indigent burial. I think some, but I I'm not real up on what the precise regulations are for that yes and we do do that um, many people who are for instance in a nursing home and they have no family they still have an account so we will obviously work with the state's attorney we have a, a assistant state's attorney that we work that we deal with 
And if that's the case and we know that, then we can have those assets frozen um, and, you know, go after, go after them uh, in the courts. Um, or actually many times the, um, the, the home or residential uh, facility that they're in will cut us a check uh, from, their, from their, um, um, their assets for the most part. But, yeah, that's a long and arduous process, obviously, as you know. And, um, but we do do it. Uh, but still, there are people that, you know, just don't have any money in their accounts um, or people who take it out once they pass. And we were stuck with them. And just if I, you would indulge me one further comment. Uh, I think yesterday, nationally, they released the figures on the opioid deaths. And as I recall, the news report, it said it was the by far the largest year on year increase since they started keeping records and was a huge increase nationally. And I just wonder what anybody thinks can be done about that. That's probably too well, much I, you, for today. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people doing a lot of different things. And I don't know the answer to that. You know, a reporter asked me the other day and I just, I, I don't know. Um, you know, we, we deal with, you know, defining the death and, 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 you know, we have ideas, but it's a, it's still a huge problem. And, you know, obviously the pandemic didn't really help us with our, um, you know, mental health initiatives, you know, by, you know, not allowing people, and, and again, rightfully so, but not allowing people to, to congregate and, um, you know, uh, kind of subside some of their, uh, you know, mental health issues and whatnot. So when you isolate, that's not a good thing uh, mentally, typically. So yeah, I, at this point, uh, yeah, we've had, this is the most we've ever had. Are the increases identifiable within subgroups? I mean, are there, uh, is it economic based? Is it uh, ethnically based or is it just across the board? Well, what we've, interestingly enough, what we found is that uh, in prior years, the biggest, the largest age group, you could say that the passes, uh, you know, from opioid addiction was 30 to 30 to 39. Um, that has now moved up to 40 to 49. So we still have a lot of people from the ages of 30 to 39 that are passing away. But now the number one group is the 40 to 49 group, which is probably a little bit um, different than most people would have thought. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, I think this is an important conversation and um, um, thank you, Mr. Shepard, for bringing it up. I think we should you know, dive into this a little bit more. Um, I know uh, Mr. Sanchez is, is on too. I think this is a public health um, discussion. I think we should, we should bring up. Um, okay, um, so let's just go ahead and move on. I'm losing people <laughs> here. So um, we don't, um, our old business was already discussed. Um, we don't have any new business. Okay. Um, can I have consensus to place our written reports on file? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. okay. Um, and yes. no need for we're executive we're session. Um, thank you all for your time today. I know it was a long meeting, but I think it was a well. Consensus to adjourn. Um, Chair, go. Mr. Shepro. May I be recorded as voting yes on the Merit Commission resolution? I had stepped out of the room. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll do that. And if I can have consensus to adjourn. Motion yes. to adjourn. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. See you next month.